All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome into this post game show. Sorry, it's a little bit late we're as, as we're uh, getting started here. I'm uh, still figuring out the platform and how exactly I want for everything to go and look. Hopefully, everybody, we sound off. Everything's looking good. Thanks for joining into this Pacers post game show. They did not look good. That first half was troubling. Very troubling to allow a player like Damian Lillard to go off like he did. 35 points, inexcusable. You got to have a better performance than that if you're the Pacers. You absolutely do. That was so troubling, the way in which uh, they showed up and showed out and started that game and one that we knew needed to be there. We needed to see so much more from this Indiana Pacers team. And, you know, I wasn't too surprised that – they slug it a little bit out of the gates, right? Um, this is all new to them. They're all trying to figure it out. But at the same time here, uh, they didn't recover. And when they did in the second half a little bit, it was too late. Got to within 12 at the end of the third quarter. But by then, I mean, like the story we've seen many times this season is when you get to that point, they'd use so much energy, so much time and such to get back into the game that then it was a challenge uh, to go above that. Also, they just did not have the firepower tonight. 20% from three-point land. They're not going to win the game uh, doing that. Never. Like, that's just not their MO. On top of that, season-low point total with a 94. They had 99 earlier in the year and a loss to the Chicago Bulls. But outside of that, they lost, what, 16 of 17 games this season when failing to score 110 points. We knew going into this game that they had to score. That was not the problem. We expected for them to score. We expected them to get out and run. I think they had four first-half uh, transition points. Not nearly enough. That's not going to get it done as well. Uh, and the biggest alarming thing I think that we saw – was Tyrese Halliburton offensively? Yeah, if you just look at the numbers, you might think, hey, overall had a, a diverse con contributions, nine points, seven rebounds, eight assists. But he was only four of seven. That last shot was in the final seconds, one, and one of two from three-point land before that. You need a lot more from your franchise star. You need a lot more from a guy who's getting a max contract. You have to demand a lot more. And there's no excuses in terms of, He's not healthy. He, um, that left hamstring injury. No, he even said that's not an issue uh, anymore. Now it's not 100%, but that won't happen until the, after the season. On top of that, uh, you can't say he's mentally or physically fatigued. They just had a week off. They just had a week between games, two days off, four days of practice. And among those, a couple of them were a little bit light. So not as big a deal uh, right there. By the way, thanks for joining me for those of – you who have thus far, this is something new we're doing. So spread the word, uh, if you will. Uh, and thanks for jumping on here. I'm also going to post this as a podcast as well on the Fieldhouse Files podcast. If you maybe missed the beginning or want to go back uh, and listen to it again. But you expected the big performance from Damian Lillard. You expected a big performance from Pascal Siakam. That's what stars do. That's what players with experience absolutely contribute. And I thought both of those did a nice job. Although I will acknowledge it was a little bit weird to see how uh, Damian Lillard did not score in the second half. Finished with 35 points. It was best half of his postseason career, uh, but did not score after that. Didn't have to, though, because of the contributions elsewhere across the roster, though he was 0 for 6 in the second half. If you see me turning, I got my multiple monitor set up here uh, in the office. I appreciate you joining in here. I'd like to be at the games, but have had issues with credentialing. And so uh, we're just going to pivot and do something much more enjoyable and fun right now. Uh, by the way, you can jump in onto this conversation. That's the one thing I do like about YouTube and getting others involved. I saw Ryan has already taken advantage of that uh, with the first comment. And please, Feel free to do so. Seemed like the Pacers settled a lot when it came to sh shot selection. And I agree, Ryan, especially early on. What we saw in that first half is guys were just running around with their heads cut off. This was so new to them. Uh, I think they were just so hyped up, uh, a little anxious, absolutely. And that was a comment Rick Carlisle said before the game earlier this week. Hey, we're anxious. We're ready to get going. He said he had packed, been packed since Tuesday. What does that tell you? They're eager to get going. Carlisle hadn't won a playoff game since 2011. And get this. This is a tough statistic 
but stats don't lie right here. Pacers have not won a playoff game since 2018. You got to go back to their playoff series that stretch seven games with the Cleveland Cavaliers, what many fans uh, know that one as, you know, the goaltending series. Uh, the Pacers were the better team in that series. It's just one team had LeBron, and LeBron helped carry them to uh, <laughs> that series win over the Pacers. Then they were swept by the Boston Celtics. Then in the bubble, shorthanded with guys in and out. Remember, Oladipo decommitted essentially to playing, but then realized, hey, I, to get my money, I actually have to commit. He you know, didn't do too much. Sabonis, I believe, returned home. He was hurt and didn't play. That was the T.J. Warren series. But the Pacers have went um, the last couple of postseasons in 19 and 20 getting swept. Of course, had been out of the playoffs each of the last three years as they pivoted to the rebuild after the Nate Bjorkren era. And now laid an egg here for this first game. I'm not... It's not even worth like giving them credit. Great. You came back in the second half. You played well in the third quarter, much like you have done all season. Well, great, but you shouldn't put yourself in that type of situation, right? All right, comments are going, so let's get it going. Pacers in five. Wow, that's some confidence, Zach. I had a friend text me during the second half seeing that the you could get Bucks minus two and a half for game two um, after what we had just seen in the first half bubble Warren, yep you absolutely remember that young goat mike sink says i don't understand tj attempting three-point shots when tyrese is on the court it happened on back-to-back -back plays yeah i remember the sequence you're talking about i believe it was in the third quarter on the basket to our left and i did question that a little bit because uh, if tj is open by himself right the defense is sagging off because they're good with that they're encouraging him to take that shot i'm fine with it but if Tyrese is out there, you rather live and die with Tyrese. Up until the last month or so, TJ was avoiding the three-pointers. Now, in the last game, we saw him hit, I think, three. We've seen him hit at least one in what has felt like every game over the last month and a half. Not exactly. Um, that's where that confidence is from. And so, yes, when the defense sags off, I'm good with him taking it. But if someone else is more wide open, and it's especially your star, if it's Pascal or if it's Tyrese, I'd like to see that more. You'd rather go down with him swinging. No question about that. Uh, Siakam was the only one who showed up, said Young Goat, and that is absolutely true. You could tell, I thought. Let me know what you think. I, I thought you could tell right away. He was. He brought a sense of calm. He was good. Uh, early on, he looked to do what he does best, which is attack. Uh, what you really want to see if you're the Pacers in general, and even continuing on in this series is you want – to either Pascal create on his own, attacking off the dribble. He went to the line, what did he do, 10 times? He's got to hit more, though. I just realized five for 10. That's not nearly good enough and not going to get it done. But at least he got there. He attempted half of the Pacers' free throw attempts, finished with a double-double with 36 points, 13 rebounds. You can see why the Pacers went after him. You, you can see why that deal worked out nicely, giving up some first-round picks to a draft that – Teams seemingly aren't that interested in. And on top of that, uh, you give up Bruce Brown and his contract. So that was a great use of the offseason acquisition, I thought, of Bruce Brown. Now, uh, in terms of Pascal, excellent. Don't have a lot of real criticisms for him or what he was able to contribute. But where was everybody else? How about that bench? We talked so much about during the season the depth and how this team can, so, can go deep and how it has, they have the best bench in the league. Four points in the first half. Four points. That's not going to cut it, especially when the starters aren't cutting it and you need additional playing time. I was st stunned to see Isaiah Jackson uh, get some minutes. I think it was because Jalen Smith struggled there in his early minutes, ended up playing 13 minutes, did grab seven rebounds to his credit, but just two points. A couple other comments. So, many, so much puzzling about Ty not uh, being shoot first since All-Star Weekend. Um, I will say for tonight, absolutely. Since All-Star Weekend, not so much. Remember how much he struggled there out of All-Star Weekend? And that's where he was mentally and physically fatigued. Um, that's where he did struggle and need some help. Um, so back then, I don't, I'm don't. i not surprised as much. Now, with that said, um, <laughs> tonight was – I don't get. I don't understand why he only takes really six shots. One of them was late in the game. Um so you can understand that, but uh, you need to take more than six shots. I mean, the fact that TJ McConnell, who's been good 
but he t- attempts 13 shots, double what T- what Tyrese Halliburton, the face of your team, the star of your team, a max guy that's going to have his contract kick in July 1. If you're going to lose, you want it with Tyrese taking 16 shots, 15 shots. Um, I'm good with him distributing. I think he had four assists in the first quarter. Fantastic. I fully expected for Tyrese to ease into everything, for him to try to figure out things on the go, to try to uh, – to appreciate the moment to ease into it and not force things. And I'm good with that in the first quarter, but after that, I needed to see him assert himself more. I needed to see him involve himself within the offense. I do give credit to Patrick Beverly into the starting lineup. You knew those two kind of have a back and forth feud. Um, well, back Be- Beverly won this first matchup. I'd say he finished with five points, seven rebounds and eight assists in 37 minutes compared to what Tyrese did offensively. Um, you know opposing defenses are going to be clued into Tyrese. You know they're going to try to limit him. They're going to try to force him to his left hand. Uh, they're going to try to keep him off that three-point line. If you're the Bucks, you sit back. You go, we allowed for Siakam to go for 36, and no one else really killed us. I'm good with that. Uh, we limited Tyrese Halliburton to nine, po- nine points. That's it. I'm good with that. Uh, they held him to eight assists. You're good with that. If Tyrese isn't creating either – with the ball and shooting or passing and not getting 12, 15 assists, you're, you're not going to win. That's the way in which this team was built. It was built around Tyrese, his strengths of running, running and gunning, launching threes, uh, playing in the open floor. They weren't able to do that as much as they would like in that first half. Uh, and then in the second, it was just kind of too late uh, at that point where you're just trying to make it up slowly at Shirley. Back to the comments here and For those joining on the podcast later, join me and all of us for Game 2 Reaction on YouTube, uh, where I invite you to join in. Yeah, Tyrese only took seven shots. Dame 24. You don't need 24 necessarily from Tyrese. I actually think that would be too many. Uh, But give me more like 15 to 18. I don't think Ty's afraid to go cold. I think he's just trying to let the game to come to him. And this takes me back to a conversation couple of years ago, his first seasons uh, after being acquired by the Pacers, it was a old conversation about uh, when to insert, when to assert himself and when to get others involved. And again, going back to what I said a couple minutes ago, I thought in the first ha- uh, quarter, and I didn't mind it, he was very much focused on getting others involved, trying to assist, trying to let the game come to him. Then after that, we needed to see him assert himself absolutely more. Did the players, Ryan asked, did the players making their playoff debut tonight tonight look nervous? Hopefully with a game under their belt, they calmed down. Yeah, I think so. Uh, even Ben Shepard, who was just solid, got beat several times defensively. Had felt like a couple of turnovers. Yeah, two turnovers as well. Uh, four different guys on the Pacers roster had multiple turnovers. Um, Isaiah Jackson didn't do much. Jalen Smith didn't do too much. I was concerned by that. Aaron Neesmith, you need a lot more production. On top of that, you need for Nemhard and Neesmith to be better defensively. Now, it's not an individual thing. It's not directly on them, uh, but they are the primary factors. That's why in my preview on fieldhousefiles.com, I mentioned how, to me, the X factor is Andrew Nemhard. You want him to knock down a couple three-pointers per game, and you want for him to be able to contain not minimize, uh, not um, you know, stop Damian Lillard, but you got to be able to contain him. If you can keep him to 27, 25 points per game, especially while Giannis is out, I think you're good with that. You can live uh, with that, not 35 in the first half alone. And as I mentioned in my post-game story, I got a quick one up that also included this embed uh, at the buzzer. Well, as part of that, I noted a moment. It was about 3.02 to go in the first half where Lillard, I think, had 29 points. The Bucks had 58 points, and the Pacers had 29 points. So not only had Dame matched the Pacers' output by himself almost to halftime, but the Bucks had doubled up the Pacers. That's how you knew right there it was not the Pacers' game. Yes, they were going to fight back. They weren't going to bow down. They had a big third quarter, but it was just far too late. Back to the comments. Zach says, more likely reasoning to Halley's performance this evening. His first playoff game, Jitters, struggling with the hamstring more than he and the organization have shared. First of all, keynote, he doesn't like the nickname Hallie, so I never call him Hallie. He's usually either Ty or Reese, Tyrese. Um, 
just so you know, I know a lot of people call him Hallie, but I don't think it's the hamstring. I didn't see any slow movements. I didn't see him look uncomfortable. I didn't see Tyrese grimacing. Uh, what did you think? I didn't though at all. I thought, I thought it was a, a case where he was just hesitant out there and did not insert himself um, where you'd need to see stars do it. At the same time, remember how much we talk about the playoffs being much different than the regular season. And I think we saw that. We felt that uh, the Pacers took the in-season tournament so seriously, more than almost any team. And then they got a reality check in the championship game against the Lakers. The Bucks. I re we remember how Giannis felt about those in-season tournament games, right? And going to Vegas, he was like, I think, what did he have? A va vacation or maybe a daughter being born? I think it was a vacation, but he was like, yeah, I'd rather not be here. I want to be at home and not away from my family. I'm away from my family enough. That was on his mind when he was going into that semifinal game, whereas the Pacers, most of the players, about six, had not played in a playoff game to this point. So that was their biggest game yet. So, no, Zach, to answer your question, I don't think it was a case at all about the hamstring or his physicality or his uh, anything in terms of limitations. I think it was just maybe his his attitude um, and how he felt about the game and then how the game got away from all of them. And then they're all in scramble mode. I think that's what we saw after the first quarter. They got trailed by, I think, trailed by nine after one. Then it got up to 30. And at that point, it was a 24 to four run. The Pacers went like eight minutes of game time without scoring. And at that point, then I thought I saw uh, some selfishness just in terms of individuals trying to be like, all right, I got this. Let me see what I can do. Um, nothing's going our way. And so that's where he saw turnovers pile up. That's when you saw guys just try to take it themselves and not move the ball. Uh, there was a point early in the game when they had four assists on 11 field goals. That's not this Pacers team. They're at their best when the ball is moving, uh, when it's humming out there, like we saw against Atlanta one week ago when they're uh, assisting teammates. Was there even one alley-oop tonight? I don't remember one to Jalen, to Obi, to Isaiah, none of that. They weren't playing free, and I think they played heavy. You could feel the expectations, I think, uh, just at the way in which they played. And conversely, I think we saw a Bucks team that looked at ease and a Bucks team that looked like they had been there. Lillard, Middleton, Bobby Porras, Brooke Lopez, solid as usual. That experience matters. And so as much as the Pacers want to play up or hype up or lean into, uh, say, the in-season tournament, that was a big game. That felt like a playoff game. No, it didn't. Nothing feels like a playoff game until you get to this point in the season. And so uh, tonight, I think, was a little bit of a reality check as well for this Pacers team about what it takes, uh, the disposition you have to have. Rick Carlisle talked before the season, uh, sorry, before tonight's game, about how their point of attack defense must be better. Well, it wasn't to start the game at all. Um, Dame blew around players, got to the basket. Uh, then you allowed for him to catch fire, and then he got into one of those zones where he continuously knocked down shots. And unfortunately, this Pacers team, they don't have the shooters that can go three-pointer for three-pointer with him on top of just kind of lacking the experience as well. I'll continue to take your questions as we go live here on YouTube. Thanks for everyone joining in here uh, for this Pacers post-game show in the playoffs. Plan to do this for every single game. I hope the reception uh, goes over well here. Uh, what? Where am I? Yeah, Chris Robertson says one. I assume you're saying it's just one game. Um, and that's something I referenced in my column here is as bad as this one feels, it's just one game. And for the Bucks, it's a dominant win. Felt like 20, 30 point uh, difference and margin of victory throughout much of the game. It's just one victory. If they have a poor shooting night, if guys don't catch fire, uh, if the Bucks aren't able to knock down 14 threes and they only shot 47%. So it's not like they were hell beaters and played a tremendous game at all. And yet they still got it done, had the success, and so much of it, it was because of that early start. Uh, when the game got to within 12, why do you have Tyrese and Turner on the bench? You have to get aggressive there, he says. I will say in the second half, I at least appreciated how Rick Carlisle made sure to have one of Pascal and Tyrese uh, on the court at the same time or excuse me, on the court at all times with the bench unit. He went to that second quarter lineup where no, uh, neither of your two-star players were in there, and he did that throughout the regular season, of which I never understood. 
especially in the postseason. How did I start this conversation? Stars win. Stars matter in the playoffs. Um, I don't need to see the 10th guy on the bench. I really don't, except for foul trouble, maybe. I didn't mind throwing Doug McDermott in there a little bit for shooting. Unfortunately, it didn't really help too much, and it was a little too late. He attempted one three-pointer in seven minutes. Um, but that's why that's why you traded for him. You gave up a second-round pick for him. And by the way, this brings me to a good thought. I'm wondering if you guys felt the same way as well, especially early on the game when the shots weren't falling. One of the things I kept going back to is where's Buddy Heald? That was a bad trade for the Pacers. Uh, it was something to satisfy Buddy Heald. But ultimately, I don't think in general now, in hindsight, we knew it wasn't good for the Pacers. And I'm not so sure it was good for Buddy. In fact, he was just 0 for 2, 11 minutes off the bench yesterday in a 76ers loss to the New York Knicks. And I sit back and think the grass isn't always greener elsewhere. Here's the reasoning behind that. Uh, if you are unaware, which I did cover at fieldhousefiles.com back in February um, about this whole thing is, look, he's in a contract year, and they moved him from starter to reserve. And in doing so, his minutes are down. And in a contract year right here, you want to be maximized. You want to play more. You want to get more shots up. You want to have more opportunity. He also wanted to get the playoffs. And at that time, it was still unsure whether the Pacers would get there. It seemed likely. I always thought they would get in as a six seed. I thought acquiring Pascal would move you up a, a spot, maybe two to four or five. And really, they should have. Losing uh, one of those last couple of games, uh, you would have finished in fourth if you beat the Cavaliers. Like, that's how close it was, ultimately. But I couldn't help but sit back and think of how much different I feel like this would have at least started if Buddy Heald was out there, who, by the way, is kind of Tyrese's safety uh, blanket, if you will. They are so comfortable together. They feed off one another. And so when Tyrese is out there and only putting up four, six shots really in the game, you know who would be in his ass and, and saying, hey, let's go, we need you? It'd be Buddy. They're best friends, but they can also uh, irritate each other to, in a good way, in a way that can motivate one another. Also, if Buddy's not knocking down shots or maybe he's hesitating on three-pointers, Tyrese would, would get into him. So I thought that was a big missing hole here um, that was absolutely felt um, no doubt in this opportunity uh, let's keep going down here uh, your news now I thought Rick has been great this season but the rotation was wildly out of touch you need your experience guys yeah absolutely it's kind of what I was har harping on here a couple minutes ago you need your stars out there um, you need your starters out there and if you don't believe in your starters then they shouldn't be starters and I know maybe you want to mix it up you want to show a, a, a throw a different look at da Damian Lillard, for example. Uh, th so you do throw Ben Shepard out there, but the moment was a little big for him. It was uh, there early on, I thought. Um, he did settle in, knock down a couple shots, uh, did defend, and maybe even drew a charge. Um, but that's a tough moment for a guy who not only hadn't been in there, but this is his first time in the league. He hadn't faced a, a guy like Damian Lillard have a heater uh, quite like that. So I thought that was a little bit concerning when you go to 11 in the first half of the playoff game. I didn't really like that. R. Smith, shout out to Pascal. He's been the highest, he's been on the highest stage possible and played like it. Yep, yeah, no question about that. Um, and on defense, we didn't see it really too much tonight, but if or we didn't at all. But if Giannis was out there, I'd like to see that matchup and and what he might look like going against Giannis because we saw throughout the regular season as Giannis averaged 42 points per game. Uh, against the Pacers, they didn't really have much of a stopper uh, for Giannis whatsoever. And so that would be one thing I would like to to, to see. But ultimately, Pacers just did not get much um, from the guys outside of Pascal. Wanted to get a new tweet out to get a fresh batch of people to join us here on this post game show. Thanks to everyone for joining here. Um, PD says, I know this is down the road, but what do you think about Malink Monk on the wing? Uh, I'd have to look at his contract situation. I think he's a free agent, um, but also it's going to be difficult to afford him because Tyrese's max contract kicks in, right? Uh, Pas or in Pascal Siakam presumably will get a max contract here coming up. There's two max contracts, and so then you have to fill on the periphery. Uh, you'll have Miles Turner at $20 million for, what, one more season? And that's kind of your roster 
and you got to fill in from within right there. So I'm not sure exactly what his market will look like or what he'll command, uh, but the Pacers badly need a three and D guy. No doubt. I mean, a, a game where Damian Lillard goes off, even Chris Middleton, I haven't mentioned him. And he was a big question mark coming into this season or this postseason. is what does he look like? Uh, how much is he able to contribute? How much does he still have left? Right. Um, but he performed well, nine of 14, 23 points. Um, and was second on the team in scoring behind uh, Damian Lillard. So uh, a guy that can slow him down and also knock down threes, that's exactly what this Pacers team needs this season. Uh, Pacers do not have any first-round draft picks this summer. Remember, they traded away theirs and uh, as well as the other pieces uh, that they had. So uh, they went all in on this Pascal Siakam trade, remember? They traded this year's first plus two futures. Uh, to acquire Pascal Siakam at that kind of near the trade deadline. So they're not in the in the draft. They do have, I believe, a couple second round picks, but um, we'll get to that later on when it matters. Taking more of your guys' questions here on our YouTube post game show. Appreciate everyone joining in and staying with us here as the Pacers lose 109-94 to this Milwaukee Bucks team. And I do appreciate some of the comments coming out. Pacers haven't made excuses. They know, uh, according to Miles, they got jumped and did not do well uh, from the very beginning. And they know they have to be better. They know they have to play at a higher clip. They know they have to get back to playing more of their Pacers basketball. I thought Doc Rivers and the Bucks did a nice job of really getting the Pacers out of what they wanted to do, what they wanted to accomplish uh, there in the first half. And from there, it kind of let the air out of the balloon and the Pacers were climbing uphill the rest of the way. They felt defeated. And how could you not getting down by 30 there in just 24 minutes? It was an ugly first half. What they have? 42 first half points. The Pacers have had, what was it against the Hawks? They had 49 points in the first quarter. I know the stakes are very different. I know the level of opponent is very different. Yet that adds the context of how poor that first half was. Luis says, for a smarter player as Tyrese is, why does he seemingly completely strip his confidence away when he's defended with pressure? There's a lot of new things that Tyrese has faced this season. Among them have been pressure or seeing two guys come at him. Uh, I remember looking up there in the first quarter, and Malik Beasley was picking him up full court when he didn't even have the ball. That's all by design, and that makes everything difficult. That's smart if you're the Bucs, that you want to make everything difficult and make him work as well make him work uh going up and down the court and not just walk it up or or get it to the three-point line whatsoever if you make him difficult everything difficult for him if you make him work at everything you're going to get slow into your offense so you can't play at that pace again just four points in transition for the pacers in the first half um and ultimately the bucks imposed their will they struck the pacers first and the pacers really didn't answer had a slight answer in that third quarter, outscoring him 29 to 14. But by that, truly, it felt too late. Again, it felt like they were climbing uphill after that. And they really were um, just because of the challenges in a playoff game on the road at Pfizer Forum uh, for the first time. That is so difficult. And by the way, a player I have not mentioned at all is a player they badly could use right now. And that's Benedict Mather, a dog, a competitor, a guy that would get so pissed off in that first quarter. Um, that he would he would play even harder. Uh, he he would take it personal. I was surprised we didn't see a little bit of that. In fact, from Tyrese in that first half here of him playing with an edge, playing a little bit pissed off. I would have liked to see that a little bit more, no doubt. Um, from that teams, that was just brutal. And so now, uh, maybe maybe less advance it. Where do the Pacers go from here? First of all, they got to look within themselves. They got to they got to realize they just that was an ass whooping. They did not play up to their standard. They did not perform very well whatsoever. Uh, the number one guy that you knew was going to go off, he went off. 35 points in the first half. That you knew was – it's not like, I don't know, picking a random guy. Pat, Pat Connington, who's had a nice season, I think. It's not like he went off and scored 20 points in the first half uh, whatsoever. You saw this coming. You didn't react quick enough. Uh, and defensively, you have to up the pressure. You have to change things. Maybe you send two – right away or, or and make you know his, his teammates um step up early on because much like the Pacers with Tyrese Halliburton 
And if Giannis remains out for the next couple of games, which I think is more likely than not, uh, Dame's got to step up. You remove him from the equation a little bit, or you keep him to 20, 25 points. All right, now you're talking. Now you're now you're playing. Now, at the same time, that said, uh, one of the simplest adjustments, right? Just knock down some shots. And you're not going to win a game if you're the Pacers going 8 of 39 from range. They missed their first 13 three-pointers. That's not nearly good enough. And so the Pacers know that. Um, it was a new environment. I, I saw somebody, I forget who it was, joke that the Pacers shooting looks like a college team playing in a stadium in the NCAA tournament. A little bit. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny because I hate stadiums for that reason, is the sight lines and everything is different, which leads to lower scores and usually uh, poor shooting, um, for sure. A couple questions here. Another question, why is Jarris not trusted as much as Ben Shepard? That's a simple question. Jer ben is much more uh, along in his process than Jarris simply because of age and experience. Uh, we saw Ben play four years at Belmont, Jarris – just 20 years old, played in a very different system, too, down in Houston. Yes, is it a pro-style uh, offense, defense down in Houston? But I remember talking with Jarris one-on-one after a game about this, and he said, yeah, there's an extreme learning curve because defensively the principles are much different. I, there was a lot more freedom for Jarris Walker down in Houston where he was um, able to kind of be a free safety. He could roam. He could take risks. Well, those are the things that the Pacers, specifically Rick Carlisle, have been trying to eliminate from his game. Less risk. Uh, trying to stabilize things. Because if if he whiffs, that puts everybody else uh, you know, on edge in terms of uh, having a numbers game. Then it's five on four. They're attacking the basket. Um, on top of that, I think Ben is just a lot more solid in what he is doing and, and providing defensively and offensively. Now, with that said... One of the biggest uh, improvements that we saw from Jarris, obviously the Pacers lottery pick, as I'm sure most of you are aware. Uh, Jarris knocked down threes at a great clip, and what did the Pacers need? Uh, Three-pointers. But I do not expect to see Jarris much in this series, if at all. Um, you talk about the Pacers playing 11 guys in this game, especially in the first half. Jarris is not one of those. He's on the outside there. Um, probably the next guy to come in. But I was surprised to see Isaiah Jackson so soon. I was surprised to see Ben Shepard so soon. I thought Shep would get an opportunity because of his defense. And really, he's a 3 and D guy. He plays smart. He knows the principles and can execute. Rick Carlisle's talked several times about how when Shep's out there, you don't have to worry about anything. He's going to be in the right spot. Uh, he might make mistakes, to be sure. But he's going to be in the right spot. And you can count on him to play hard. That's the number one thing with Ben is he plays hard, dies for loose balls. He provides those intangibles um, as well. Hey, a newcomer on here, Dayton Gray. I just can't see the Pacers having a prayer in this series after Tyrese not looking to be aggressive as a scorer. He says he feels healthy, but he shouldn't take seven shots in a game. I agree, Dayton, and I touched on this a lot uh, earlier here as we now stretch past the half-hour point. But to kind of reiterate – uh, what I was saying, Tyrese is definitely healthy. He's not 100%, but really nobody is healthy at this point in the season. Um, that's just that's just how things go right now uh, with where they're at. But um, nobody would argue that he, he doesn't need to take more shots. He absolutely does. Because you can live with him taking 15 shots per game and losing. Uh, if you're losing anyway and your star player is only taking six, seven shots, no, that's not a good look. You need a lot more. The team is asking a lot more of him from leadership to being the face of the team, to doing interviews and being prepared for the moment, to stepping up in huddles, all those different things. In addition, though, I also want to point out just eight assists. When he's at his best, it's 12, 15 assists. And, yes, a lot of that will come down to teammates weren't making shots. A lot of guys were not making threes. But – this was clearly not Tyrese at his best, and I don't. There's not much wiggle room. I don't think this is not a great Pacers team. That's why I've said all along, uh, this is not a contending team by any means. I don't see them getting um, to the conference finals or anything like that. Like so many, I felt like were optimistic. I was stunned to see so many experts, you know, pick the Pacers in this series because the Bucks have the experience, they have the firepower. They have a Hall of Famer in Damian Lillard, 
if Giannis plays a game or two, all the better. Um, Middleton solid. Lopez is solid. Portis very well might be six man of the year. Um, they are just solid where the Pacers are still trying to figure out what they are. The Pacers are still trying to grow in um, to what they want to become. And Pascal is the better player on this team. Tyrese is, uh, or the more complete player too. And I think Tyrese though can still lead the way, still lead the charge. But ideally to have success, you'd really like to see Tyrese contribute something like 12 points, 12 assists to have a chance at a winning effort. So I would agree with that, Dayton. R. Smith again, Shep has proven that he belongs in the rotation. Jairus isn't ready. Um, I agree with the Shep point with Jairus. What are you doing? This is not a contending roster. To me, I'm getting Jairus playing time. And I'm talking more specifically probably about the regular season. It, it all comes down to what the front office and coaching staff believe this season is about. To me, I sit back and say, what are your overwhelming goals? What is What do you want to get done in the totality? And to me, I want to get a, your lottery pick. I want to invest with, in him. I want to give him a chance. I want to see what he has. And what have we been talking about so much about this Pacers team? Their lack of experience. Well, if you don't play Jairus now in the playoffs, that'll be the same storyline for him come the postseason next year. And, and now I get not playing him because he didn't get as much reps as you would like during the regular season. Um, but I would like to see him play more because who knows? I mean, Obi Toppin, for example, is a free agent. Now you do own his bird rights, so you can bring him back, matching any offer out there. Jalen Smith holds a player option. We'll see what he ultimately decides to do um, with his contract. But those are a couple of the fours out there. So you would like to see Jairus Walker more. But I guess what I'm getting at is I wouldn't expect to see him to play now when he wasn't getting that playing time uh, during the regular season. How do, uh, your news now is asking, how do you feel like Andrew did tonight? Not sure we have a better option. Would, would TJ really have been worse on Dame tonight? They both got a crack at him. And yeah, yeah for much as we like TJ, um, teams, teams will hunt him. They'll hunt Tyrese Halliburton at that guard spot defensively. Um, I don't think anyone really did great defensively. No one sticks out in my mind. I mean, even Miles Turner. Uh, zero blocks tonight, zero blocks in 32 minutes. That's a rarity for a guy like him who is so forceful. Now, um, a lot of nuance to that in different matchups and cross matches and those sorts of things um, that I won't necessarily get into right now. But uh, I don't think anyone was really good defensively. Um, and so that's where they can also make a big improvement. Uh, but it starts in that that first half when – uh, the Bucks really sent a message. I'm not a guy that's like, what was the statement made? I thought they did make a statement actually in that first half. And that was as much to themselves and their fans as I think it was to the Pacers because there was a lot of doubt. The sports books, for example, which kind of gauges not necessarily who they think is going to win, but what the bets coming in say. And the Pacers were favored by one point entering tonight's matchup in game one. I thought that was pretty telling um, about – kind of the feel coming in. And so that tells me right away, going back to what the Bucks and the way in which they were able to start the game, I think that was huge for them and their confidence um, and how they were able to start. Because, yeah, like they were talking about, they knew early in the week that Giannis is not going to be available to start this series. We all did, essentially. When the two national newsbreakers come in a week before game one and say, it's not looking good, he's not really doing well right now, or at least hasn't made significant progress, um, and there's a lot of doubt about his status, that's telling all in its own right. Because if you're anywhere close, you're going to give it a go. And the comments or the message or lingo that's going to be framed with that story will be, hey, he's going to see how his body responds, or we'll see how he comes through their final practice, or let's he's going to wait and see what it looks like the day of or after shoot-around. That's not at all what it was about Giannis. And so I think – the start was as more important for the Bucks themselves than it was for what the Pacers and the way in which they started uh, the game. Uh, to answer your question simply, Nemhart has to be better defensively. I thought he was just okay. Um, there's some tactical things. I think Jenny Busick and Jim Boylan, the kind of defensive uh, coaches on the roster staff, can address, uh, but they got to be better as a whole. Being tagged as favorites was the curse in part. Bucks came in with the dog mentality. Yeah, exactly. Kind of goes to back exactly to what I was just talking about there. Um, it 
didn't set them up for failure or anything like that. But you would, I think, like to be counted out if you're this Pacers team that does not have postseason experience. Um, that could only help you, right? And we saw the Pacer teams years ago. I remember being in the locker room with so many of the different guys here. And, you know, Paul George and C.J. Miles, Solomon Hill talking about um, how they love being the underdog. They love being counted out. How, for whatever reason, they played better in those games versus when uh, they were favored. And we saw that all season long, by the way. To go back to your comment, MK Sinks here, how many times did the Pacers have a bad performance against a team they should have steamrolled? I go back to my, kind of my laundry list. The Trailblazers, twice. The Hornets, I think, a couple times. The Spurs, the Wizards. That's like 10 games right there that the Pacers should have handled on their own. And maybe you lose a couple of them. You win eight or t- eight of 10 of those, you're the second seed. And you do so in a season where you acquire Pascal Siakam, you move on from Buddy Heald, and Tyrese Halliburton isn't himself for two months of the season. You're feeling really good about yourselves there. But also, with that said, how many times did we talk about the maturity of this team is not where it needs to be, how that needs to be elevated, how leadership has to improve? Um, how they can't dig themselves holes early. We saw that so many times. There was a stretch, I want to say, in March where they lost the first quarter in like six straight games or where they trailed by double digits in the first quarter for so many games. That speaks to all those previous points. And so I was not surprised with how today's game went because of that. Yeah, Raptors, yeah. That was the last game I was thinking of a couple, like 20 minutes ago about the game they should have won and failed Raptors are trying to lose trying to get a better a top six pick in the lottery and the Pacers failed in that one hey new commenter Darius saying does Tyrese have anyone that would tell him to shoot more be aggressive um or does he just let or do they just let him do what he wants um no they don't just let him do what he wants um they do lean on him to get a feel for the game and and react accordingly so let's say Miles Turner has a hot hand. Um, Aaron Neesmith's knocked down two threes. Yeah, they they trust him to get them the ball and keep shooting, just like if uh, he has a 20-point quarter, maybe he plays the entire quarter and he's not pulled out with two minutes left. Um, the big player, the perhaps the most influential person um, in terms of his game for Tyrese that I know of is Drew Hanlon. He, he works with Tyrese and – Obviously, that's on the offensive side of the game. Uh, Hanlon obviously works with Joel Embiid, I think Tatum, um, many others out there. Um, And I talked with him earlier this season. Maybe I'll write that story about their relationship and how um, Tyrese very much leans on Drew when he needs it. And I got to believe this will be a time like that. Uh, Drew sends him video clips. They talk on the phone after every game. He gives him advice and, and tips about what he's seen. And he, there was even a game earlier this year against Boston where Tyrese was, in his words, trash when he played poorly in the first half. So Tyrese looked up, read the negativity on Twitter, which I'm surprised you would do that just because that's the last thing I'd want to turn to. But that's motivation. These elite athletes turn to that motivation. And then on top of that, Drew Hanlon shot him a text of saying, hey, you're better than this. Attack. Get to your spots. Those different things. And that was huge. For Tyrese, I think I will write that story this week after this performance, by the way. And on top of a story about Pascal Siakam and why he wanted to be here, what encouraged him about this fit, playing with Miles and all those different things. Those are your top two players. So win or loss, those two are always going to be the storyline and the top story. Pascal played well, 36 points, 13 rebounds, led the team in both categories. It was just his 42nd game, I think, with the Pacers this season. Now, on the other side, Tyrese, a lot of room for improvement. That's the good thing here is not a lot of time to sit on this. You have Monday practice, a light physical practice, but mentally it'll be a challenge, right? Um, They'll get shots up. They'll work on three-point shooting, work on their free throws, because that was a little bit concerning as well. Pascal Siakam going 5 of 10 at the free throw line as a team. The Pacers were 14 for 21 at the line. That's not going to get it done. But they'll do that. They'll have film study as well. Uh, Get out on the court. Try to see some shots go through. Talk about defensive adjustments that they'll make. 
And I know it's kind of a cliche in covering playoff series, but it's absolutely true. And it's that things become very interesting after game one going into a game two, because you see the adjustments. Sometimes it's really when the series shifts to a different city, you have a little bit more time to make adjustments. You have a larger picture, larger sample size of what the opposing team is trying to do. Of course, the Pacers were trying to play fast. Of course they were trying to knock down three pointers, but more specifically, the Bucks will have a better indication of how the Pacers choose to attack Lillard and defend him and maybe trap him or throw several guys at him individually, those sorts of things. So uh, they'll have what from game from Tuesday to Friday, game two to game three, that's where you'll see the most adjustments, but you will all absolutely, um, excuse me, see some adjustments going into game two from both teams, as you would expect. A couple more questions I will take here on my Pacers post game wrap up show. If you've missed any part of that, you can watch a replay here coming up on YouTube as well. Make sure you subscribe to my channel. A lot of Pacers coverage you probably didn't realize was there uh, on my YouTube page until now. I'm thinking about Miles Turner, uh, a video I did of him recently, Herb Simon, going into the Hall of Fame, uh, and a lot more. A couple more questions, though, I'll take on this postgame show. Joey, welcome. He says this game kind of summarizes their struggles throughout the season. Poor starts. Puts them in bad spots along with struggles on the defensive end. Becomes evident more like today. Absolutely. Completely agree entirely. I think this was an example of what we have seen throughout much of the regular season. I think some of what we saw during the in-season tournament and even the regular season was a little bit fool's gold. Pacers got more up for the in-season tournament. They treated those games like playoff games. They were so excited and thrilled just to participate, just to be on national TV. Because remember, they were only selected to play on national TV once this season. Then the in-season tournament happened. Um, then they were finally able to play in that game. And now to start this series, they played on national TV as well and got their ass kicked. And that had to be alarming. Um, just kind of a smack in the face for this team as you get this postseason started. But again, you don't have a lot of time to uh, dwell on it. Now it's time for adjustments. The coaching staff tonight, I guarantee you, We'll go back to the team hotel, probably order room service, and get right to work breaking down the film and watching tonight's game before they even go to bed. That's absolutely how those coaches work. And um, for the players, they'll go back, ice, relax, get some fluids, um, and get some food as well before trying to get a great night's sleep going into practice tomorrow at Pfizer Forum up in Milwaukee. Silver line, lining, thanks goodness this was not a play-in and it's a series. Yes, absolutely, because guess what? The play-in is not the playoffs. I don't care how many people want to talk about that. The play-in is not the playoffs. So um, we were able to see the Pacers avoid playing in those games. Um, they do have an elevated stakes, but it's still not even at the playoff uh, level. So – yeah, they were able to avoid the play-in, but a very disappointing performance Sunday night by the Pacers up in Milwaukee. Appreciate everyone who joined in of this post-game live. And again, it'll live uh, on YouTube and on Fieldhouse Files where you can subscribe, read all my content, and get it delivered directly to your inbox. A tough loss, 109.94. That wraps it up for this Fieldhouse Files Pacers playoff post-game show. Thanks for everyone for joining me. And I'll talk to you again soon.